Hi, I'm Eric Espinoza. I have a background in chemistry. That was where I started my science career as an undergraduate. I then went to Stanford for a PhD in biochemistry. I worked with Suzanne Pfeffer. I have a bunch of papers in science cell, journal cell biology, and I don't know, two dozen patents at this point in next-gen sequencing and protein engineering. Um, and this is one of the things I do for my free time is we work on cuttlefish. We hang out at BioCurious, we keep this place running, we keep this place going. And today we're gonna go over the science. We're going to go deep into all of the molecular biology and biochemistry and cell biology of what we're working on, why we're working on it, why this works. I very much encourage all of you to ask questions. Stop me at any point, and I can, I will be happy to address your questions if I know the answer. If I don't know the answer, which there's a lot of things I don't know, then we will figure out an answer or figure out some way to make you happy about it, okay? Um, so we're first going to start off with our cuttlefish. All right, I did not draw this. Many of you know my lovely drawing and handwriting skills. This is not me. This is Sequoia. So this is our guy, right? Also in the tank. Uh, one of the big projects that we're working on is learning all about what makes this guy tick, okay? So I'm gonna start by asking, and one of the ways that I teach and one of the ways we're gonna do this is it's a very open form where I'm gonna ask all of you guys questions. And I don't know everyone's name here, so I'm gonna point to you. And if I point to you, I'm gonna ask you your name while I point to you. Um, some of you, I do know your names, and I'll just address you by your name. But this is going to be a very sort of a communication style lecture, right? We have a cuttlefish. It's an animal, right? What, is it, what are animals made up of? What are all organisms made up of? Cells. Cells, right? These are all made up of nice little cells, right? What kind of cells are these? Does this cuttlefish have? Is it eukaryote or prokaryote? Eukaryote. It's eukaryote. What does that mean? Nucleus. As a nucleus. What else does it mean? Organelles. Organelles. So we have a nice ER that continues off the nucleus, goes to the cell, has a Golgi. We have no idea if the Golgi is actually stacked or if it's dispersed. Has endosomes, has lysozymes, lysosomes, it has mitochondria. So this is what the cell is made out of. We have no idea what this cuttlefish's cells look like. Just no clue, right? Some of the things we know about human cells, we know a lot about what these organelles look like and what these organelles do for humans. <coughs> we don't know anything about this for cuttlefish, right? Nothing. What else do we have inside the cell? So we have the cells that has organelles. What's inside of the nucleus of a cell? DNA. The chromosomes. And what do the chromosomes make up? DNA. The DNA. And if we go to the central dogma of biology, which I always like writing, it's a little higher than I can, DNA goes to RNA, which is then made into proteins. Oh, I spelled proteins wrong already. And these are the things that we are really curious about. What are each of these molecules that make this cuttlefish function? These things all work together to make this. These things all work together to make this. All right, how, right? This is the big overarching thing. How is all of this put together to get this lovely organism that can hunt, that can see, that can respire, does all sorts of great things, right? So what are some of the ways that we've approached this? Do you guys remember how we've done this so far? What are the things that we've, we've done? Yeah. We tried anatomy. I'm sorry? We tried dissection. We have done the anatomy, so we've done a lot of dissection. For those of you that have been here around a while, what have we found out about the dissection? So we have a lot of pictures of cuttlefish, we have a lot of pictures of squid, octopus, other cephalopods. What are some of the interesting things from the dissection team that we've discovered? At a high level, yeah, Darsh. Uh, so none of the diagrams that are online look anything like the cuttlefish we dissected, so no. that's a lot of the process we did dissection is just finding out all the nuances and shapes and ex Exactly right. As Darsh pointed out, Every diagram that we have been able to find of what cuttlefish anatomy looks like does not apply to any of the cuttlefish we have dissected. They are completely wrong. And why this is the case, I have no idea. I'm not sure if anybody's actually really dissected a cuttlefish and really looked deeply at this. I suspect, it's my <coughs> suspicion, that these, all those diagrams come from squid dissections and they sort of apply them and mesh the squid organs into the cuttlefish. But that was one of the early things that we discovered upon dissection is that none of these things match, right? We see those, uh, those diagrams, 
we can't find the organs in the right spot. We see these organs in very different spots than what the diagram says they should be at, which is a problem. The first time we did it, we thought maybe we had a weird specimen. The second time we did it, we thought maybe there's something really up with the lot we had. By the time we're getting the third, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, the seventh, and we're seeing the same sort of structures in not the right places, we really start seeing a trend that these are just the diagrams aren't just not correct. Yeah, Frank. What were you saying? No, oh, you didn't say. Okay. So that was the early thing that we noticed. Dissection wrong. The anatomy is just not what we expected at all. And this is kind of nice in some ways because it means that we can really contribute right away with some very basic physiology of this thing and the, and the biology of it, okay? So what else have we done with this thing? So we've done dissection. We have a lot of really good information. We're gonna talk a little more about this too. What else have we done? Yeah, Adarsh. Well, we tried to do PCR with it. Well, initially, initially we tried to do PCR with it. Yeah. Let's, let's, let's not quite get to PCR quite yet, all right? Let's DNA, still build up. DNA, RNA extraction. That's right. We're doing nucleic acid extractions, right? The DNA and the RNA, right? And the reality is we have extracted these, this, and this, right? DNA, RNA, and the proteins, right? We can extract each of them because each of them give us a little bit different information, right? So we have the DNA. I want someone to tell me a bit about eukaryotic DNA. Who wants to tell me about eukaryotic DNA, Frank? It's linear. It's linear. Packaged very tightly in chromosomes. Yep, tightly packaged into chromosomes. What else about it? How much of the DNA is actually encoding regions versus not? Does that make a sense? Uh, Low. 30%, 20%? No, way less. Oh. Single percentage. Okay. We're talking, at least in humans and most other vertebrates, we're talking, and in fact, actually everything that I know is about 1 to 2%. Of the, the genome. Of the genome. Yeah. Is for coding. All right. And what I mean by in the coding region is you have your DNA goes to make a single stranded RNA, which then goes to make a nice globular protein that does stuff. Okay. So DNA is always double stranded. Your mRNA, your RNAs in the cell are typically single-stranded. And then your proteins fold into complex shapes. Right? These folds are very, very important. And they are not easily predicted, at least not currently. And so we have to do a lot of work. This is easy. This is relatively easy. This is hard. Okay? These become easy because we have things like sequencing technology. We can read the DNA very easily. We can read the RNA very easily. Reading a protein is incredibly difficult. We do not have the technology to do this in a very easy way right now. Right? The current methods all require you to know this before you can even get this. Okay. So what have we done? How have we attap attempted to extract these nucleic acids that are easy? Brief over. We're still on overview time, guys. What have we done? Yeah, Eric, what have we done? Well, back a bit. You says 1 to 2% of DNA is coding. Yep. What's the other 99%? And Great. second question, why are they so excited that they figured out about 1%? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So Eric's first question is, what are these, what are these other pieces? All right, so we have 1% is coding. What do we call this part of the genome? Genes. Genes, but there's a specific name for them. They're exons, guys. Oh, right, exons. Oh. Exons. <clears throat> this is typically what we call them, or exons. All right, so genes are made of introns and exons. Right? These introns are spliced out from the spliceosome, which is an RNA protein complex. These exons are stitched together to make your actual transcribed mRNA. Right? This is your messenger RNA. It has a bunch of exons stitched together. These exons go to make your nice little globular protein. What do you think happens to those introns? Recycled. Recycled, discarded. 
that's a common thought. It's, there, there's some evidence these days that they might be doing something a little more, might be having some regulatory functions, but they don't make, they don't make proteins. They are excised, removed from, this, removed from the transcript. You start making this long piece of mRNA in the nucleus. That mRNA is then spliced down into just the exons. What do you put on every <laughs> single mature mRNA? What's at the end? A's, exactly right. Poly A tail. Every single mRNA gets a poly A tail. This is very, very, very convenient for us. Okay. Why do you think this is convenient? What's one of the nice things about having a poly A tail? Every single mRNA has this exact same thing. Why is this convenient, Frank? We can use it to isolate mRNAs. That's right. We can use it to isolate <laughs> mRNA. So the mRNA is five prime to three prime, poly A tail is on the three prime end. We can use a poly T primer to get the sequence of all the mRNAs. Okay. This is very nice and convenient for us. Right? As I was saying before, it's easy to get the DNA and the RNA sequence. We can just take the letters, read them off by next-gen sequencing devices or even Sanger sequencing if we really want to do some, a lot of work, uh, and that's really nice for us. So part of Eric's other question that I sort of glossed over is what else does the rest of the genome do, right? Unknown, Eric, unknown. A lot of it is regulatory. A lot of the parts are pro, uh, promoters where they turn genes on and turn things off. There's a lot of regulation in there, and there's a lot of things of just absolute unknown function, right? We don't know what they do. They're often thought of as junk <laughs> DNA, there's a lot of things we thought of where junk DNA are actually quite important, um, but it is unclear of what a lot of these things do. And they don't need to have a function. Yeah. So what What's your name again? Rubel. Rubel. Ruben or Rubel? Rubel. Rubel. Okay. What percentage of the DNA is neutron? Just everything Large. related to an RNA? Uh, no, not everything. That's a, that's a very, very good question. And I do not have a good answer for you. Um, I will tell you the vast majority of the mRNA transcript is in fact intron. If I were pulling a number out of my head, I would probably put around 90% of an mRNA is intron. But the, a lot of the cell, a lot of the genome in fact, doesn't even code, isn't even part of a gene. It's just sort of intragenic regions. And we don't really have, know what it does, if it has a function at all. Um, it's just sort of there. And if it doesn't really hurt it, then you know, there's no reason to really get rid of it. It doesn't really provide an advantage, doesn't provide a disadvantage, so it sort of stays around. Uh, but these intron regions are huge. They can be kilobases. It can be thousands of bases, or you have exons that are hundreds of bases. Um, and so they're big. And who knows? I don't know what they do. I, don't, I couldn't even tell you why they exist. I, I'm not sure anyone really knows why. Uh, this is very different from prokaryotes. So prokaryotes have no introns. It's just exons. Just a promoter, turns on an mRNA. You get some untranslated regions on both the five and three prime end, but what you see is what you get with the prokaryote. With eukaryotes, this is a very, very different game. Okay. Did I get all your questions, Eric? Yep. Okay, just making sure. All right, so we did the DNA, and we have to do some extraction of the DNA. We can't just take the DNA and pluck out a nucleus. So what's sort of the route we take here? What do we do? So I'm going to walk me through our entire plan that we started off with. How do we even start these experiments to get DNA? What do we do? You, yeah. So I was going to step back one. Of course. Um, so uh, the, whole, the whole splicing yes. thing, right? So bacteria, so, but my understanding is the splicing allows for different variations potentially of proteins, yep. but, but bacteria evolve and change quickly, but yet they're not spliced. Yep. Bacteria do not do, prokaryotes do almost no splicing. Here, so I would have thought there's that, always an, that there's would always facilitate an exception. the ev quick evolution splicing would, but uh, it's not a so it's no. not part of that. Yeah, and I will tell you one of the dirty little secrets of biology that we sort of don't really talk about much is splice variants, exactly what you sort of hit on. And different mRNAs have different introns and exons. So we may call this, like I wrote these exons here as kind of like one, two, three, but there's, no reason a lot of genes have a dozen exons and only six of those dozen are actually put together into an mRNA. How the cell picks which ones, <coughs> unknown. It does it regularly, certain cells do it regularly and reproducibly, but it is unknown entirely how it picks, which ones and why. It's 
unknown. And it is a dirty little secret because a lot of times you can get exons one, two, and four and leave three out entirely, especially in certain cell types. And you change the conditions of the cell a little bit and all of a sudden you come back to getting one, two, and three. And it's consistent. And it's, it turns out to be fairly consistent. There are always exceptions in biology. Biology is just a bunch of stochastic distributions. Um, but it's, it, it's a dirty little secret because this is not really known uh, how this is happening. Um, Right. So how do we do the DNA extraction? What do we do? Yeah, Jay. Uh, first, you uh, break everything up into small pieces. Yep. And step then back. Let's step back from that even. Yeah, okay. We take part of the cuttlefish. Yeah. We have cuttlefish. Take a snippet of the cuttlefish off. Different type of tissue, different types different of tissue. tissue. Yeah, we started off taking just the whole cuttlefish. When they, especially when they die, uh, we'll take the whole cuttlefish. Then what we do? Now we break it up into small pieces. Maybe, yeah, that's right. Yeah. And depending on the tissue, you're going to have different mixes of proteins and other things there. So you're going to have slightly different outcome depending on the tissue you're starting with. But what about the DNA? The DNA should be the same. DNA should be identical. Yeah. Every cell should have the same copy of DNA. Every right. single cell should. And every cell is going to have a slightly different proportion of mRNAs that are going to be made from this cell. And this is one of those nice things that we get every, every single cell, even in your body, every cell should have the same copies. Should. Right. You get some variation as you age, as you get older, as you get farther and farther away from your progenitor cell, you get mutations, you get changes, but that's sort of the overall scheme is that every single cell has the same DNA. And that's convenient for us because we can take some tissue, it doesn't matter where, they should all be the same, grind it up into little pieces, into like a little goo into our test tube. So what do we have in this goo now? We've cut up the cells, we've taken a bunch of these cells, probably 100,000, million, 10 million cells, cut it up, then what do we do, Jay? Well, you wanna make sure the cells are lysed and then you wanna use the differing properties of solubility and affinity yep. to isolate the different fractions, uh, yep. DNA, RNA, and proteins. Yep. So we wanna isolate different macromolecules. Right. And we can isolate different macromolecules because they all have slightly different properties, okay? DNA, does someone want to tell me about the chemical back, the chemistry of DNA? Can anyone tell me about the chemistry of DNA? If I start writing things like this, put a base here, put an O here, put an O here, what goes here? Phosphate, very good. So negatively so charged. Negatively yeah. charged. There's an O. Where does this go? Um, Another phosphate. All right. What's here? What's here for DNA? Deoxy, so it's H. Just H. Okay. What about for RNA? OH. So these are the chemical differences between DNA and RNA, is at this site. Okay. Has everyone here had chemistry? Have you guys had chemistry? A long time ago? No? One of the nice things, one of the nice things, one of the things about oxygen is oxygen has a lone pair. It actually has a couple lone pairs depending on the state it's in. Right? When you put an oxygen here on this OH, on this 2 prime <coughs> OH, This oxygen can attack that phosphate, all right? And what happens is this bond breaks. Isn't this the pillar? It is. Uh, That's why RNA is so fragile. This is why RNA is so much more fragile than DNA. And by having this one change here, so much nice to we can't get self-cleavage anymore, right? And we can use all of these properties to our advantage in separating the DNA from the RNA from the proteins, okay? What's, what is it about proteins? How do proteins fold? Does anyone know how proteins fold? I'm kind of jumping pretty far ahead here in concept. But Darcy, do you know how proteins fold? It has to do with like the parts, certain parts are, they're how they react to water, like hydrophobicity. Exactly right, You're, you, you nailed it, right? It's all about, it's called the hydrophobic effect. 
I need to erase some things on here. Right? Proteins fold by excluding water. Right? Proteins have a very, very hydrophobic side. And when you have a hydrophobic side, putting water on it requires the water to be ordered. Things in the universe do not like to be ordered. That takes energy. They can release energy by releasing that water and allowing that water to rotate freely in three dimensions. And by releasing that and allowing it to rotate in three dimensions, it frees up energy. So proteins fold by excluding that water and allowing all these hydrophobic pieces to come together. Right? And what that does is all of those energies that from excluding that water drives that folding force and keeps that protein together. This is really important because what we can do with this protein layer is we can put it into something that's really hydrophobic into an organic solvent and get rid of and take all the proteins, right? And that's one of the ways that we can separate this. And so each of these has slightly different properties and we use those properties to extract them and to take each of them out. So we start with our goo here and in this goo is DNA, RNA, protein. What else do you think is in this besides DNA, RNA, and protein? Lipids. Lipids, very good. What else? There's one more big macromolecule. Like carbohydrates. Carbohydrates, yep. Carbohydrates. So lipids, do you think <coughs> lipids are hydrophobic or hydrophilic? Hydrophobic. Phobic. <coughs> what about proteins? I just said. Hydrophobic. They're hydrophobic. They're quite hydrophobic. All right, what about DNA and RNA? Hydrophilic. Hydrophilic. Right? These charges make things hydrophilic. Adding things like oxygens here make it more hydrophilic. So these things are hydrophilic. Carbohydrates, these are kind of can be a mix. It depends. These are more of a it depends kind of thing. It depends on how many hydroxyls it has, how many OHs it has on it. It depends. But we can separate these things very nicely. So in the very, very first way that we did this, probably a year and a half ago now, maybe even two years ago at this point, how do we extract the DNA and the RNA and the protein? You guys remember what we did? Does anyone know what we did? We did columns. We did what's called a silica column. All right. And silica columns have very nice properties that if it's a very hydrophobic condition, if you add things like ethanol to make your solvent or to make your solution more hydrophobic, nucleic acids will bind to the silica column. All right. So you can get DNA and RNA to bind to these columns, and proteins will not. Okay. It's very, very, very convenient for us. All right. So we got this, we got some DNA, and we got some RNA. You guys remember what happened when we did this? Contamination. It was contaminated. And it was contaminated with something that was inhibiting all of our downstream reactions. All right. We couldn't get rid of it. In fact, we were getting, you guys remember the color of our nucleic acids that we were getting? You guys remember? Huh? It was a dark purple. The first thing that tipped us off that something was amiss is we had purple DNA. You should never have purple DNA. DNA should be clear and colorless. Uh, but you know, sometimes it doesn't. You know, if you're dealing with some sort of other organisms or plants, sometimes that coloration doesn't actually matter. Uh, so we move forward, and what did we see? Nothing. Nothing worked. Right. We start with silica columns. This didn't work, right? What do we do next? Does anyone remember what we did next? Six months of silica columns. Six months of silica columns. <laughs> to, over to, and over and to over again. <laughs> that this was bad, or at least questionably bad, right? They had something in there. We were assuming it was the purple. Could have been anything else, and purple is just an indicator. And it was the PCR reaction that was failing. The PCR reaction was failing. In fact, everything was failing. <laughs> uh -huh. Was yeah. it purple every time or sometimes? Every time. Every and what else besides the PCR was failing? Uh, the sequencing reactions were failing. Oh, okay. The like the um, enzymatic digestions were failing. We were even we even took the DNA and tried to use restriction enzymes okay. to digest it to see if we could get a nicer banding pattern. Uh huh. Nothing. Okay. Nothing. Everything. So all failed. the enzyme reactions were being blocked. Blocked. Everything was failing. All right. right. That was actually some of the later experiments. Is that we were starting like, well, PCR isn't working. Is it our DNA or is it, you know, the reaction? And we had no positive control because we couldn't get anything to work. So we said, let's get something to work. We know restriction enzymes work. Restriction enzymes didn't work. Uh -huh. Not good. This gave us a big, frowny face. All right, so 
what, what do we do next? Do you guys remember what we did next? What's the common property of DNA and RNA? What do we see here? What's on that phosphate? Negative charge. It's a negative charge. All right, I'm gonna actually take a quick break and really erase everything here. Do we have an eraser up here, Mariah? No, I'm just gonna get you a paper towel. Yeah, give me a paper towel. I'm gonna have to erase Sequoia's cuttlefish. It can't stay there. Well, you can get it's rid okay. of the cell right now. I'm gonna get rid of all this other stuff up here. Okay. Eventually, we'll get rid of the cuttlefish. Um, how are you guys liking this so far? Deep dive, when we said deep dive, this was deep dive, right? So we started with what is a cell and how do we look at the cuttlefish? What, where did we start with this? And where have we been trying to go? So remember this started with, can we sequence it? Can we pull its DNA out? Negative charge here. Right. So what kind of column did we do next? What kind of separation do you think is the most logical thing to do next? If you know that all the nucleic acid has a negative charge. What's a way that we can actually hold on to a negative charge? The positive charge. Or the positive charge. Very good. Very good. So yeah. we That's use physics, not chemistry. Uh huh. Chemistry. <laughs> uh -huh. <laughs> chemistry. I'm not getting into the fight with you on camera. <laughs> uh, so we did an ion exchange chromatography. Ion exchange chromatography. All right. So we try to take this DNA. I shouldn't have erased this down here. We try to take our purple. DNA and RNA, put over an ion exchange column. Hopefully this would help purify our stuff, all right? What we got out was, at least this time, it was more clear or more colorless. Still slightly purple. And did this work? Nope, did not work. You're right, Darsh, did not work. Still didn't work. frowny face. Right? So we were still getting something that is a negatively charged contaminant that is coming along with our DNA that we can't seem to get rid of using conventional means. Right? What do we do next? Phenol chloroform. Right? Next we went on to chemical extraction. Separate separation. Yeah. All right, so we did actual solvent. We changed the solvents, All right? So we used what's called phenol and chloroform to extract our nucleic acid. Why do you think that we should do this? Yeah, Frank. Maybe the whatever's disrupting the reaction is less soluble. Exactly right. The new yeah. Solvent. One of, the, one of the things that we know, or at least the, the next hypothesis here, is that the contaminant that's inhibiting all of our reactions is probably not the DNA itself or the RNA itself. Probably not. I'm not going to go too far and say it's definitely not. Uh, probably not. It's probably something else. And if it's something else, it has a, it's very likely to have a very different solubility in different, or, in different solvents than our DNA or RNA. So we did a good old school chemi chemistry way of using phenol and chloroform. <coughs> All right, so we took our DNA or our RNA <laughs> and put them into phenol and added chloroform. Right. So what does that do? Let's say we have our nice tube. What does that do? We get layers, right? What's on the top layer? Water. Our water, our aqueous layer. What's on our bottom layer? Phenol chloroform. Our chloroform layer. Or our organic layer. Okay. What, what's typically, if we add DNA and RNA, what's typically, where is the DNA going to be? Right at the interface. Right, this is where our DNA goes. What's, where does the RNA go? Aqueous. The aqueous. Right. Where do all the other stuff typically go? Most likely. Yeah. Bottom. In the bottom, into the organic layer. So this is where your proteins are going to be. These are where your lipids are going to be. This is where our other stuff is going to be. Yeah, Frank. It's interesting how the phenol layer sinks under the water, whereas other chloroform, chloroform sinks, in, in, sinks under the water, whereas other most other organic solvents float on top of the... Well, it's all about chemistry of it. 
It's all about the density. Chloroform is heavy. You know why? Why do you think chloroform is heavy? What do you think the mol What do you think the mol the formula of chloroform is? CCl4. Yeah, I think it's actually CHCl3. CHCl3. But I think I think that's what it oh, is. Oh yeah, yeah. But you're yeah. close. It's oh, it's so, it's very. Yeah, you're right. It's CHCl3. It's the chlorine. That's real heavy. You know what the molecular weight of a chlor of chlorine atom is? Like 35, I think. Right. I think it's 30. We have a periodic table behind you. I, I don't I don't know what this is. I think it's 35 or maybe. It's all right, it's heavy. You know what the molecular weight of oxygen is? 16. 16. Right. 16. Yeah. Twice. You've got a lot more and a lot more molecules, right? So that's not, it's sort of a, don't get too caught up on that for density though. Uh, but this is a much heavier molecule, so it sinks. Okay. Yeah. All right. And then what, we, what happened when we did it this way? And we extracted, took our DNA the very first time. What happened then? Worked. Then we were happy, then it worked, right? So our enzymatic reactions worked, our PCR worked. All right, so now we have concluded that we had some sort of a contaminant that was coming along with our no other normal preps that we managed to get rid of with our penile chloroform extraction. What were some of the next experiments we did to confirm this and prove this? So we have our column DNA, our silica column DNA, we have our ion exchange column, and we have our phenol chloroform DNA, right? So when we look at our things like our PCR or our restriction enzyme digest, this didn't work. Either PCR restriction enzyme didn't work with our silica column, it didn't work with our ion exchange column, but it did work with our phenol chloroform extracted DNA at first. Okay? What do we do next to now prove that this is the case, that we have a contaminant here? How do we prove this? Add the contaminant back in. Add the contaminant back in, all right? So when we take the ion exchange DNA plus the phenol chloroform DNA, did this work? No. No. What about when we did the silica column with the phenol chloroform DNA? Did this work? No. No. It did not. The silica column plus the ion exchange column still didn't work. And we're still left at the end of the day with the phenol chloroform always working, right? This is a really, really nice set of experiments that we did probably last July, I think. And this is what set off uh, Anna's entire sort of scheme of what's going on. Why is this happening the way it is? And she made a really nice paper about the penile floor from extraction and how it affects the PCR reactions. She did a nice concentration curve where she was starting to add back these, these pieces. And she actually found where that if you did, if you diluted this stuff down one to 20, and added 5% solution of these inhibited compounds back in, you could actually still get your PCR reaction to work. Really, really nice set of experiments she did. Very happy with it, right? So we have a contaminant. What would we do next? If we cared enough, which I'm gonna tell you, I don't really care enough to do it, but if we cared enough, how would we go about figuring out what that contaminant is? What do you think we would do? Yeah, Josh. Exactly right. Get ink, get mucus, add them back in and see. And you know what happened when we did this, when Anna did those experiments? We add our clean DNA that works with the ink, no longer work, right? Very, very nice experiment. Very conclusive in fact that the ink, something in the ink is at least contributing to, it may not be all of it, but it at least is sufficient for it, right? This is enough to, inhibit all the reactions. The next good question is, well, what is it in the ink that's inhibited? Well, yeah. now, did you have the problem if you took like a tentacle or a body part that did not have any ink in it? Did we have the same problem? Yes, and there, the problem appears to be a little more than just the ink. 
right. the ink could be going through the whole system. Ink is one of the big problems. And the other thing that Anna also did is skin. All right? What is it? Do you know what it is about the cuttlefish skin? What color is the cuttlefish skin? Well, it has the anything. chromite. The chromophores. Could be anything. The color things in it. <clears throat> yeah. When she also did skin. Does it also have mucus on it though? Yes, it does. So yeah, that's that's a problem. No, it's not a problem. It just confirms that we have inhibitors, right? Yeah, right. right. It doesn't really tell us. It's, it, we have no idea what this inhibitor is. That's right? true. And this is why I've been trying to be very careful about jumping to the conclusion that it's the ink, it's the mucus. We don't actually know what this inhibitor is. We know that there is an inhibitor that is in both the ink and on the skin that is inhibiting these reactions. Right. Can we try mucus without skin? I don't think we have mucus without skin. <laughs> okay. uh, that's a hard experiment. That's a hard, uh, hard to etch away. Okay. Um, but that is a fantastic experiment. And one of the things that I actually want to see Anna do next, or any of you guys do next, is to start fractionating either the ink. I would like to actually see the ink first because it's a little easier to fractionate ink. Um, and start doing fractionation on the ink and doing activity assays by fraction and saying which of the components of the ink are responsible for the inhibition. Using right. chromatography to use chromatography. Yeah. Either use size chromatography, use another ion exchange chromatography, mm -hmm. separate the ink however you want to separate it, and then test each fraction for activity. These are really, really good old fashioned biochemical experiments that will help narrow down and figure out exactly what these contaminants are. Mm -hmm. I will tell you for the scope of this project we're working on, this is not something that I am super, super interested in figuring this out. I think we have other much bigger things to do. But if you guys want to look into this, I would love to see the answer to this. It's a curiosity, but it's not the most important experiment for me. Okay? So we did all of this work, found out that we could get rid of the contaminant using basically chloroform. I'm not sure. We can, the phenol helps a lot with doing the extraction. The phenol also helps you separate things a little better. Uh, but what we really needed to do is use an organic solvent to get rid of that contaminant. In fact, Later on, after this, Jay took another entire cuttlefish and did a different extraction method on it, which also used chloroform, ended up with another great set of DNA that I think we've been using for the last couple yeah, months. Yeah, have been. That's, the yeah. DNA that's worked quite well and reproducibly. We, we spent a lot of DNA from the initial phenol chloroform here, uh, but Jay's, Jay has a nice, very clean prep that he made, so we've been using that. It's been working out great, in fact, yeah. uh, to get rid of these contaminants unfortunate that we had we spent so long suffering the contaminants but we know the answer now right yeah and so again this was about 18 months of work to get to just here yeah well, we have an answer now we have a solution we know how to fix this problem and we can execute on it um, we're gonna do one last topic before we break and I want to talk about our PCR reactions okay what are we doing with our PCR reactions Someone tell me about what genes we're looking at. Someone tell me about what our positive controls are. What are some of our negative controls? What are some of our thoughts? Yeah, Frank. We're trying to find COX-1 gene. COX-1, that's the big one that we look for. Why do we care <coughs> so much about COX-1? COX-1 is ubiquitous across all, all eukaryotes. Across so all eukaryotes. Do you know what it does? It's cytochrome C. It makes cytochrome C. It's a cytochrome, it's not, it doesn't make cytochrome C. It's a cytochrome oxidase. Oh. Uh, I guess it does kind of make sense. Maybe not. Part of it. Yeah. Um, COX-1. This is oftentimes often called COI as well. Yeah. I think this is, might be the more modern name for it. This is the version that I was taught how to call it. This is a mitochondrial gene. This is an essential gene. This is one of the genes that allows your mitochondria to make huge amounts of ATP per molecule of glucose. Okay. Electron transfer chain. Exactly. This harnesses the electron transport chain. And because of that, this, every single eukaryote, anything that has a mitochondria has this gene, right? What do you think the likelihood of our cuttlefish not having this is? Zero. Be effectively zero. If it did not, be dead. it would be dead. It would be, yeah, I would probably think it's an alien species. Uh, a different electron transport chain mechanism. <laughs> <laughs> which, which we've never exist. seen right. ever. <laughs> at which point you've discovered a new path for life. Oh, yeah. Exactly. I mean, at so, this point, this so plants complexity. also, even though they don't have a mitochondria, plants do have mitochondria. Oh, they do. Okay. They do. Yeah. 
Yeah, mitochondria oh, were the yeah, first thing. Oh, that's right. Okay. Photosynthesis on chloroplast. They also have mitochondria. Yeah. Right, right. Okay. Um, the the mitochondria was the first thing symbiosed by the progenitor cell, and then the chloroplast was the second one. Ah, oh, I got and it. And that's okay. a different branch. Um, I actually didn't know that. I, I didn't know that when I was an undergrad, and I got teased by the biologist for not knowing that. But <laughs> what do I know? I'm chemist. Uh, <laughs> um, so everything has this, right? It would be unbelievably shocking. I mean, it, it would be one of the bigger findings in science if we found an organism like this. I, there was something, I think it was in 2010, when a group claimed to have found an arsenic-based ba backbone. I don't know if you guys remember this. Probably a lot of you guys are too young to remember this. They claimed that they found an arsenic backbone of DNA of an organism in Lake Mono. And it was a huge deal. Right? Oh, I remember that. Yeah, they yeah. found this arsenic backbone. Yeah, yeah. And then like, the, the chemist in me is like, well, this isn't possible, OK? Like, you can't make these polymers with arsenic like you can with phosphate. Uh, and it turns out they used an arsenic-based buffer and everything. Um, it was not true. It just can't be true. And that's well, this is the, the caliber of that. It would be profound. Um, so we know this is we know this exists. We know this has to be in the mitochondria. So we look for it. And this is a very very nice thing to look for because it is so essential. It has constant regions. So if we look at things like if this is our Cox one gene. Boy, I need to erase, do some erasing here. This is our Cox one gene. We know that this region, I'm just drawing a schematic there, guys. This is not perfect. We know that these regions are essential for electron transport, right? So these do not vary. These are conserved. Conserved, I can't spell. And because they're so well conserved, we can actually design primers to amplify this region. Okay. This region in between, not nearly as conserved, not absolutely necessary. So this is allowed to vary over the course of life, right? Over the course of the eons, over the course of generations, you can accumulate mutations here. But you, can, you, you can't accumulate mutations here, otherwise you kill electron transport. That organism cannot survive, right? This is very fortunate for us because it means that we can amplify the COX-1 gene and sequence it. And this makes it a barcode, okay? Yes, sir. COX-1 is just multi-cell or single cell also? Anything with a mitochondria. So it can be a single cell. So things like amoeba or protists that have mitochondria will have this gene. Um, and plants? Also has this gene. It's a little bit different. They are so ancient. I mean, plants and animals diverged, I don't know, like 700 million years ago or 800 million years ago. You can't use the same primers. Exact same scheme, though. Exact same scheme. About how many bases are in those conserved sections? Uh, for invertebrates, this is about 700. Oh, in the middle, 700. How about on the ends? This, uh, they're, they're about, they're, they're, I couldn't tell you. Oh, okay. Um, but, I couldn't tell you. Yeah, it's too big. Big. I mean, this is, this is a large gene. Yeah. Or, well, relatively large. It's a large protein. Huh, yeah, mm. large protein. Um, couldn't tell you what the outsides are. I just know that this is 700. Okay. Uh, and this 700 base pairs really gives you a barcode. In fact, there's something called the BOLD database. The barcode of life database, right? In this database is every single one of these. You no. Know, is our cuttlefish in that database? Yes. No. Nope. It is not. We have one sequence of it from our earlier work, or two sequence. Actually, I think we have two sequence from our earlier work now. And those will get submitted to the to the bowl, but it is, currently there are zero bendensis in there. There are other cuttlefish. Or other there are other cuttlefish. We've, we've, done, in we've done two sequences so we've done far. Two sequences. Did they match up okay? Or? They matched up quite well. Okay. Within the reason of there was a couple bases on. Yes. Yeah. Quite reasonable. Uh, which is why we have to do this many times. Mm -hmm. we'll, I, every time we'll do this. Every time we do a PCR reaction, we'll do COX one. We'll isolate it. We'll send it off for Sanger sequencing. As we get more and more, we'll figure out if, is this just a variation across species, maybe, or across the same species. Maybe the ones that we get from the Indonesian Ocean are different from the ones that we get from a different manufacturer that selects them elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Could be, it happens. Um, so these 700 basers, these give us a barcode and this will tell us exactly what species we have, right? All of our downstream experiments, everything we do moving forward, we will match these 700 base pairs with what we do. We will see to make sure that these things all match up, right? And they should. 
And if they don't match up, it means we don't have cuttlefish anymore. Okay? Does this make sense? I think we're going to take a short little break right now. And then after this, next topic will be the cell line. All right? That's what we're going to focus on the next is cell line work. And we're going to talk about taking the DNA, taking the RNA, why we even bother taking the DNA and RNA, and why I care so much about it to make these cell lines. Okay? Break. I need some water. We've got water in the kitchen.